I'm going to be doing a bit of a big picture overview and then looking at some of the myths and some of the ideas that I think prevent the localization movement from gaining the momentum that I think it deserves and I believe is absolutely essential. And first of all, I would say that in order to see localization as we have been promoting it and seeing it for these last 40 years, it's absolutely vital that we start off with a very big picture analysis. And that means an analysis that really looks at the whole globe, not just from within industrial society. And so when I started this work, more than half of the global population was still on the land, mostly farming, you know, fishing, animal husbandry, and so on. But most of them were either in small villages or small towns or dispersed on the land. And for these 40 years, for me, one of the biggest issues of all has been the recognition that the globalizing economy is removing them from the land and pushing them into bigger and bigger mega cities. So in terms of understanding this global local dimension, it's very fundamentally about a balance between urban and rural. And how, what would it take for us to regain a balance that I believe is necessary for our survival, but it's also necessary for the, for the survival of the rest of creation. Because the current system is, as we were saying yesterday also, is systematically destroying biodiversity. You know, every, literally now by the minute, we're losing species and we're losing languages. So with this bigger picture analysis then, uh, the urban-rural becomes fundamental, and also what becomes fundamental is recognizing that in the industrial economy, our leaders, our economists, have literally been pushing farmers and fishermen and all of those who work directly with the natural world, that primary production <coughs> has been pushed to behave like factory production. From the very inception of this <coughs> modern economy, the assumption has been that we need to push these people to have standard products so that the apples should be as round and perfect as rubber balls <coughs> or you know, this sort of absolute elimination essentially of reality, which is that each and every apple is unique and different. Each and every human is unique and different. So from our point of view, we really are talking about uh, a truly a pro-life uh, economy um, that is pro the diversity of life. And we are looking at a system that is fundamentally anti-life. Why, so then um, when, we, when we describe the sort of central acupressure point of the system as being global versus local, this is because we have seen that the separation, the distancing of production from consumption is absolutely fundamental to the growth of giant or, uh, corporations and banks that have become, in effect, a type of empire that we need to label and put on the map, not by uh, trying to point the finger and say everyone inside that map, everyone in that empire of corporations and banks is a bad guy, all of us on the outside are good guys. No. When we really look at what's been happening, it's been mainly ignorance that has been driving and pushing the system <laughs> in the direction of these long distances and these giant for-profit institutions that have come to dominate. As Sulak was saying earlier, part of the problem has also been the empire of individual nations. So part of our analysis is also seeing how the growth in that empire of nations has been hand in hand with the growth of the power of those corporations and banks. So from the very beginning of this modern economy, those giant multinational corporations were part of the scene. They were the ones that went out and from Europe enslaved populations, literally enslaved, genocide, to conform to the needs of the central empire, at that time Europe. And 
at that time, the indigenous people were forced to abandon their traditions and cultures through absolute force, through genocide, through genocide and war. In the new incarnation, what we're seeing is that it is as much a type of seduction through media and very importantly through education, as Manish so brilliantly pointed out this morning. And what he was showing you there is, uh, you know, all the people we work with in the so-called fourth world and so-called third world will testify to the brutality of this type of schooling. So this is a very, very important piece of the big picture that we need to look at. And we need to look at the link between this schooling and the urbanization, this removal from the land, the creation of the big mega cities. Then, also just to say that when we talk about localizing then, we're talking about shortening those distances between production and consumption. We're talking about that as a very high priority when it comes to that most important production of all, which is food. The only thing that human beings produce that every person on the planet needs roughly three times a day. So how insane is it that we allow our government policy to separate us further and further from the food that we need every day? And we allow that to happen while we talk about the need to reduce CO2 emissions. And not only that, we are now being influenced <coughs> by corporate-funded research and corporate-funded influence in the media and academia that tell us that buying local food does not reduce CO2 emissions. So one of the most important things that I want to keep coming back to is the urgent need for education as activism. Education of this bigger picture that we can only get through more grassroots or alternative channels. Almost any time an idea gets out really widely, and has the support of the media, immediately we have to ask ourselves, how does this support this wealth accumulation of the 1%? That was, that certainly is, uh, you know, one of the fundamental ideas that's been pushed is that the best thing we can do to help the so-called third world out of poverty is to build schools, is to bring schools and education, particularly to women. And so many well-intentioned people have ended up supporting that, not realizing that it is a curriculum that, as we can see, Vedanta, the mining corporation, but also uh, corporations across the board are aware that they need to bring people up to a certain level of literacy in order to create the labor that they need in the, in the corporate manufacturing and I don't know how many of you have seen our film. Actually, could I ask for a showing of hands? How many of you have seen, oh, let's do it this way. How many of you, you have not seen The Economics of Happiness? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, I'm quite surprised, and I very much hope that you will look at it. So I will repeat some more things from the film then. And one of them is that Prachar, one of our other colleagues from Thailand, is he talks in there about the schooling and urbanization as being a conscious way of creating the cheap labor pool for the corporate manufacturing. Um, and, and to a great extent, again, we have evidence that's true. Uh, someone who volunteered with us for many years <coughs> was doing a research project at the University of Oregon, and she was completely committed. She spent decades of her life devoted to the idea that raising the educational level of women in the third world was the best way to both you know, reduce poverty and overpopulation and to create a happier, healthier <coughs> world. And then in her research, she, really, she actually saw in black and white that this USAID project that they were working with from the university was actually saying in black and white that this was a way to help the US corporations get the labor that they needed and the skills that they need. So I'm probably belaboring that too much, but to move on. 
Um, but what I, what I also think is very, very important when we look at localization as a systemic shift in direction is that we differentiate between how local we need to go. We, we talk about a principle of subsidiarity. With food, we could almost say that the shorter the distance is the better. The closer to home that we can get a diverse, healthy diet, the better for us and the better for the planet. Of course, there are going to be exceptions. There are many parts of the world where, you, especially today, you're not going to be able to eat local <coughs> food and survive. In many places in the world, if you say eat only local, you'll be eating cotton or rubber. So, you know, we're talking about a process of shifting, changing production, and that is beginning to happen from the grassroots in a most splendid way. It is so amazing because the local food movement worldwide has happened without any help from academia, from the media, from government, almost no funding in the beginning. And it's happened through the sort of hard work and sweat sort of equity of volunteerism in the in the cons on the consumer side and farmers who had the courage to shift direction. Many of them were very afraid to do so in the beginning. But anyway, this local food movement is about increasing the diversity and the wealth of that food. And, and it is showing itself to be actually a recipe for increasing abundance and wealth in a way that I think we haven't even begun to comprehend. Because from my experience, the indigenous cultures who did have primarily local food, local fiber and building material, they didn't focus on how can we increase the richness and the diversity of this local economy while still not increasing the ecological footprint. What they did generally was develop quite a good, uh, quite a good abundance but then they basically had a lot of leisure. And they weren't living on a crowded planet, so they didn't have to figure out, you know, how can we do this without having, um, without having a negative effect on the planet. So we're talking about a new experiment, and it's demonstrating itself to be vastly more successful and effective than we can begin to imagine. You know, farmers who are growing two things within two years are growing 20 different things and providing things that in the local area hadn't been available for, you know, for generations. So another aspect of localization that is far more difficult to explain and that is just as important is that we use that language because we are aware that the buildup of centralized power that imposed monoculture, broke down community, started with the nation state, and yet, what we are talking about right now is the absolute need to make use of the nation state supposed democratic structure in order to now take control of this even bigger empire, this interlinked empire of banks and corporations. In order to take control of them, we need to see, we feel quite convinced that instead of scaling up governance to global government to control and regulate these deregulated banks and corporations, we need to scale down business and banking so that it belongs to a place. General Motors needs to stay American. Toyota needs to stay J Japanese to start with. This is a very, very important point which we don't have time now to belabor too much, but I hope Many of you will, will look at our film and follow up with the materials on the web. We have a lot, a lot of uh, materials and links. This particular discussion has not been elaborated enough, but this is why we talk about localizing, place-basing business. And we believe this distinction between scaling up governance versus scaling down business <coughs> is absolutely fundamental and yeah, really important. So this is why we see localization as a systemic alternative. What are some of the obstacles, some of the myths that prevent this change? And for us, what seems to be a very clear trajectory. I would say one of the biggest ones is that we have this belief about poverty in the third world. 
we, we have lost sight of the fact that the poverty in the so-called third world is a product of colonialism. Colonialism is the early stages of the global economy. That's how the global economy came about when global businesses sourced cheap labor over here, slave labor, cheap resources over here, factory labor in Britain that had been created by driving people off the land and closing the commons, driving people off the land to become cheap labor. That's the roots of the global economy, and it's very important that we see this trajectory to be clear about where we need to go. Because when we don't see that poverty in the third world as a product of the global economy, we still often will believe that, well, you know, they, aren't, they need to earn a little bit more money, so they need a bit of globalization. They need a bit of development to come up to a certain level, and we need to move down. If we draw the map of the global corporations and banks and see the history, it becomes very clear that worldwide, people need to have the right to prioritize food for themselves as the number one priority, that they need to be able to provide for their own shoes, their own building materials, their own banking. Why should they be working for us? Why have we been trained to believe that the best thing we can do as good citizens of the world is to buy things from Africa because that's the only way they're going to get out of poverty. We need to realize that the best thing we can do is to help support the rebuilding of their local economies, particularly starting with food. Another huge block, another myth that's been bandied about is that in the name of justice, the so-called third world shouldn't be asked to reduce CO2 emissions as quickly as we do. This has been a tragedy to see in much of the global movement, this misconception. The corporations, as we know, are wanting to go, are being forced to go to where labor is cheapest. Forced because some of them and some of our finance ministers, by deregulating global trade and global production, are forcing businesses to go to where labor is cheaper, otherwise they won't be competitive. So they're wanting to go to where labor is cheapest, guess what, that's the so-called third world. They want to be able to have as much fossil fuel consumption to produce our shoes, our cars, our clothing over there. Those CO2 emissions in the third world are actually our dirty laundry. And we have, for Far too long, you know, for decades now, we have been led to believe that we were getting all sustainable and clean and look, you know, the Hudson is cleaner, the Thames is cleaner, isn't it fabulous, everyone is sustainable, government and corporation. It was just out of sight. It was on the other side of the world. So in the name of justice, let us prioritize healthy, clean food, healthy, clean water, healthy air as a human right for everyone and let's work together to make sure that our economic ideas and policies support that. <coughs> a related myth in all of this has been that after giving women a good education, the other best thing we can do is to give them a loan. So microcredit has been a big part of the mythology. And I have to tell you, I'm very happy to be able to say this to you today with my friends Manish and Sula and Gustavo here. It's been a very, very hard journey for me because for 20 years I've been trying to warn about both this myth about so-called education and the myths around microcredit. Mm -hmm. And it's been extremely lonely and very difficult. Mm -hmm. But we are at a place today where there's a sort of waking up happening very quickly. And I really believe that that can grow into a powerful movement, as we have seen with, with Occupy. Things can happen very quickly. So I'm feeling very hopeful and optimistic. And I'm grateful to you, those of you who are not booing me out of the room right now, for questioning microcredit. microcredit. <laughs> Microcredit in the West is one of the best things we can work for. 
And we have to really understand the difference between targeting rural women in the so-called third world with a loan. And see, the ideas have come out of corporate think tanks. We have been persuaded that giving aid created dependence, was patronizing. And that now we give them a loan, and that's a real business transaction, and we're treating them as an equal. It's crazy, you know. Middle class Westerners earning $100 a day, why on earth do they need to give a woman in a village who's earning $0 a day a loan? Why couldn't we give a $10 grant? And why couldn't we do that the way Schumacher recommended it? E.F. Schumacher was one of the most important economists of our time. Small is Beautiful, that book is an absolute gem and totally inspired me. And in fact, I don't think I would have started the work I did if I hadn't seen, here's a man who thinks like I do. Well, I'm going to try to get you know, these ideas out. So what he talked about was, of course, we don't want to give a grant or aid that creates dependence. We can give a grant or aid that will help build self-respect and self-reliance. The microcredit has mostly been targeting rural society. Where it goes into the slums of Calcutta or Mexico City or highly urbanized, impoverished places, it can be a good thing. But the problem is that something like 90% has actually gone into rural areas, pulling women away from having maybe a cow and some chickens and, and lots of skills uh, of, of survival, house building, etc., into producing a product for the market. Very often it'll be things like fashion clothes for Western consumers. And it's come with the satellite television that beams in the idea that your child's got to go to school, your child's got to have a school uniform, and those Adidas shoes that you have to buy, and the books that you have to buy. Mm -hmm. So it's come as a package, and it's been generally part of, a, of the avalanche of people moving away from rural areas into <coughs> urban centers. I think we need to understand that if we do not wake up to the need to localize in both North and South, and if this avalanche continues, it is sinking Titanic Earth. Because urbanization, at every step of the way today, is linked to an increase in fossil fuel consumption. And so I do think that um, yesterday, when Bill McKibben was talking about uh, CO2 and global warming as the issue, I wanted, I, mean, I didn't want to interrupt him, so, but I wanted to have the discussion with him, which we've sometimes had face to face, but I want to continue that for me, the issue that will make the biggest difference is if we focus on the economy, because when we do, we can tell people, this is about changing the opportunities for your job and your pension and your children's future, economic future, as well as reducing CO2 emissions. If we come with only the global warming argument and the CO2 emission, and particularly if we frame it the way Al Gore did, then we're putting out a message which is, this is disaster, which it may well be, um, the CO2 emission, it's your fault. You know, drive your car less, change your light bulb. Nothing whatsoever about the fact that our tax dollars are going to subsidize corporations to take our jobs to another part of the world, leaving us unemployed and impoverished, and then bringing goods back here, polluting the planet vastly more. And uh, so we have a, when we have the broad and global to local analysis, we can talk about jobs as well as the CO2 emissions, as well as the environment. And I believe that that's essential for mobilizing people. And I believe, and not just believe, I was just told by um, an environmental organization here the other day that clearly in the United States, the interest in global warming, the motivation to do something about it has plummeted, even though foundations have put many hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to create campaigns. For me, it's not a surprise at all. People are scrambling, they're running faster and faster and faster just to pay the mortgage, just to get the education for their children, which has become a necessity. 
Um, so it isn't strange if people aren't uh, paying attention to a message which tells them that they are going to fix it all by themselves. For years I've been explaining in Europe, if you say to an American, don't drive your car, it's like saying, cut your legs off. <laughs> they are living in towns and areas that are built around the park. So the main, this is, I'm feeding right into what I know Annie's going to talk a lot about, which is that we need policy change, and that we really need to focus on policy change that will take us from this wasteful consumer economy to healthy, sustainable economies. I do also want to add that in our organization, we're all the time recommending a two-track activism. We feel very empowered by the fact that we can recommend, as Becky was saying earlier, that one of the first steps you take is to reach out to friends, to like-minded people who live relatively near you. When you do that, you are building the building blocks of a healthier, happier, more sustainable world. You are reconnecting to others in a way that will also be uh, both emotionally and practically supportive. And you can start the steps towards decommercializing life by just building those little groups near to you. You can start singing and dancing and hiking and making and creating together without spending any money. You can start building the gift economy right there, right near you, and you can do it relatively quickly. It's being done, and it's an incredible gift. If you combine that with, at the same time, helping yourselves and your children to feel and be part of the natural world around you, deeply connecting in a spiritual way to the living natural world. You can do your own vision quest projects. You don't have to spend $2,000 or $5,000. Go out with a group, hiking in nature, and, and ensure that some of the time is in stillness and appreciation and joy. So, <clears throat> That is localization, and you can start it right now, and it is the economics of happiness, and we ask you to spend a minimum of 10% of your time with what we call education as activism. We believe that right now, if we all focus on getting the word out, that there is a path, there is a systemic shift we can make that will give us a new model, a new economy. We can shift our taxes, subsidies, and regulations, regulations at the local level as well as the global, we can shift those to create the economics of happiness. <coughs> I believe this is the time for that awareness building to build up the movement that can then walk out into the streets in peaceful protest and demonstration in non-violent, peaceful protest and demonstration. But I believe we should spend some time first building up the numbers by making education as activism one of our highest priorities. At the very least, I hope you'll give 10%. I would really like to urge you to give like 90% of your time to that. <laughs> but I would not urge you to do it without that first step of building that little group of connection that deep spiritual connection to others, to nature. And as Manish was saying, it's also about, see, localization is at every level. It's about the inner localization of connecting our minds to our hearts, to our bodies. It's those deeper weavings together that will bring us the joy and the, and the power and the energy to make change. Thank you.